if you're an adult with ADHD or you have a family member with ADHD and you go for treatment, you really want to know what can I expect? And there's a very predictable course of both treatment, but also the evolution of symptoms. So my slides are not changing, Car Carlita. I wonder if you could run the slides then. There we go. So will you advance them then? Okay. Yes, yes, I can, Dr. Goodman. That's not a problem. We can do it. Okay, on very good. There's some animation, so um, I guess we're going to be a little struggled here. But the first order of business here is to make sure you have an accurate diagnosis. Everything I talk about in regards to the progression of treatment is is based on the fact that you have an accurate diagnosis. And just to run through, an accurate diagnosis is based on the history, longitudinal history. If you have ADHD in adulthood, you have to have had symptoms in childhood. Now, how do you establish that? Part of that is patient recall, but also it's getting information from other observers to get historically accurate information. So typically a parent might render uh, symptoms in childhood. However, if the parent has ADHD, they may not have recognized them. So even the parent's recall of symptoms may not be accurate. And that's important because a patient's diagnosis may get missed simply because the interviewer says, well, your mom or dad said you didn't really have these symptoms. Yet the course of the patient's symptoms and impairments are very typical for ADHD. The symptoms are unchanging over the course of time. And then I like to get observer information often from adults whose self-observation is not particularly good. So they may minimize their symptoms and it's helpful to get a spouse, a family member, a sibling who can offer information about the chronicity of symptoms over time. But anybody listening to this who knows adult ADHD, this is standard diagnostic practice in getting an accurate evaluation. Next slide, please. Often we go looking for a family member who has this. 75% of ADHD is genetic. And so often there's a first degree family member. Adults get referred often because their child gets diagnosed and then the pediatrician says, which one of you has this? But when I ask the adult who's 40 or 50 years old, do you have a parent who has this? They often say no. Well, parents of that age were never diagnosed. But if you ask them, was, you, was a particular parent disorganized, late in picking you up from school, seemed to forgetful, always running late, seemed to be disorganized. Now you have, well, they had similar symptoms. And so that may be a possible diagnosis giving you the genetic link to the previous generation. Remember that in a very large US survey of psychiatric, uh, of the clinical, actually, of the general public, 75% uh, of those who had ADHD had never been diagnosed. 75% were never diagnosed. So this idea that you can't have ADHD unless you were diagnosed in childhood is simply diagnostically inaccurate. If you're over 50 years old, almost 100% of these patients coming in for an evaluation were never diagnosed. So again, you can't rest the diagnosis based on a previous diagnosis of ADHD. Next slide, please. So we also have to evaluate for other medical and psychiatric disorders. And that is before you rush to a diagnostic conclusion that somebody has ADHD because they're complaining about inattention, distractibility, and restlessness, we need to consider other possibilities. My area of particular interest now has been in adults over the age of 50 with ADHD. And so when people come in with cognitive complaints after the age of 50, um, prescribers in primary care may easily discount that as saying, well, you're not a spring chicken and this is related to age. But that would be a presumptive minimization because this person may actually have had ADHD their whole life and they're just coming in at the age of 50 or 60 to talk about these symptoms. Uh, at this point, I might make a little shout out to my patients who are over the age of 50 who are listening in on this uh, webinar today. 
Medical issues are important because those people who have had repetitive sports injuries, concussions, may have had residual symptoms. Also, if you have a severe head trauma, that causes all kinds of cognitive difficulties. However, you can't easily discount the head trauma and not consider ADHD. Why? Because people with ADHD in child and adolescents are more likely to have had concussions than non-ADHD individuals. So that's part of our evaluation. There are other medical conditions and also comorbid psychiatric conditions. If you're highly anxious, your cognitive ability is gonna be compromised. It doesn't mean you have ADHD. It means you have anxiety that's compromising your thinking ability. Again, the cornerstone of ADHD in adulthood is the symptoms developed in childhood or early adolescence and have continued relatively unchanged. If an adult says, I didn't have this for three or four years, then I don't know what you have, but you don't have ADHD. Next slide, please. So sources of impairments, everybody talks about, you'll have to animate this, you can click through. People talk about ADHD causing performance and social impairment, next click. However, if you have executive dysfunction with ADHD, that is you have difficulty planning or organizing, then your performance is further compromised. In addition, if you have emotional dysregulation, that is you have difficulty controlling your emotional fuse, you have a longer emotional fuse, you're highly impatient or easily frustrated, then that has social impairments. And so when we, when we at our center treat ADHD, we're also considering, does this person have uh, executive dysfunction? Because executive dysfunction tends not to respond as well to medication. And if you have emotional dysregulation, we have to see whether that improves with medication or whether you need additional insight-oriented cognitive behavioral therapy or an alteration in your medication. So the next slide, please. Now, let's get to specifics. We're gonna talk about what happens after you get diagnosed and start treatment over the course of six months. Next slide. So we're gonna lay this out over six months. The first half of this talk is gonna be conceptual, and then I'll dive into the details. And the first concept is we have symptoms, we have skills, we have one's own psychology, we have the outcomes, and we have quality of life. Over what period of time do each of these categories improve? Next slide. So if you go in for an evaluation, you're likely gonna be offered medication. If you choose to go on medication, medication is highly effective. It's not a maybe kind of sort of experience. If medicine's working, it's a blurred vision put on glasses. And typically you can reduce these symptoms with medication over the course of the first two months. So you go on medication and you notice your sustained attention is better, your initiative is better, you can stay in a conversation, you're better able to sit for longer periods of time if that was an issue, you're less forgetful, your recall is better, and you're less likely misplacing things and spending time looking for them. And those are just few of the symptoms that improve in a relatively short period of time. Then we move on to skills. Well, after the symptoms are reduced and you begin to realize what more you can do, this is when organizational skills can, can take root because you can remember to act consistently. You're regularly scheduling your daily time. You can write out your to-do lists. You start putting things back in the places that they belong. You are setting alarms to remind yourself during the day. You start using a day planner consistently. So many ADHD individuals are told to start using a day planner. And quite frankly, without medication, they don't stick to them and you're better able to prioritize tasks. So this kind of um, aggregates at around three or four months. The next slide. So what happens in regards to your own self-image? Once you realize that these symptoms are reduced, once you realize that these symptoms are a function of a disorder, what you start doing is you separate out who you are from what you have. You begin to realize that those symptoms that caused impairments are not who you are as a person, they're a disorder that can be treated. And this liberation is very resurrecting to one's self-image. 
This occurs again at around three, four, five months. You get an increasing sense of self-confidence because you can execute consistently. Your ability to do things during the day is better. Your task completion is more. People will say, I notice I'm finishing more things during the course of the day. Remember the untreated ADHD individual measures their day by how many things get started. The rest of the world measures the day by how many things got finished. Social interactions are more comfortable because you can stay in the conversation and you're not interrupting with non sequitur remarks that people kind of roll their eyes at. Also emerging at the beginning are strengths. You start to realize, gee, I'm really good at doing this or that and it's unencumbered by the issues of inattention and distractibility. Next slide. The other thing that happens is that people start to breathe a sigh of relief. They notice that you're less emotional, you are more patient, you're less easily frustrated. Your initiative to take on tasks is greater and you participate more in meetings or in school assignments, in lectures, wherever you are in the environment. You're more consistent in your follow through and other people recognize that. They begin to think, wow, maybe this person can really do what we expect them to do. And also you start becoming more cooperative. Another aspect is you start realizing now that your symptoms have been reduced, what other people had to deal with when your ADHD was rampant. Next slide. So what are the outcomes over the course of the six months, that five or six months, as all of this starts to strengthen, the outcomes are measurable. Job productivity improves and you get positive feedback. Financial situation improved because you can allocate money, start saving, paying off debt, making fewer errors, pay bills on time. Your self-confidence goes up because you now realize, gee, this is the new me. As long as I follow the, the treatment, stay on medicine consistently, use the organizational techniques that you learn in cognitive behavioral therapy, social relationships improve, not only at work, but at home. You're more cooperative, uh, so your partner realizes that you can participate more and carry more of your weight as a, um, a partner in a reciprocal cooperative relationship. The other interesting aspect is you start to take a look at your relationships and you start realizing that there are some people in your life that aren't contributing to your health. In fact, they enjoyed the person who was impulsive and reckless because you were the entertainment factor. And now maybe you don't want that role. The people who wanted you as the entertainer now start to drift away and other people who are more healthier start to come in your life. And so these relationships change. Next slide. So I'm gonna do this on a month to month basis. And Kalita, you could just click through this so we don't have to wait for the animations. The first month is gonna be medication effect. There's just no way to get away from this because the medication works quickly. Again, as your doctor or prescriber increases the medication slowly over a period of days or weeks, you'll notice that the ADHD symptoms improve, your focus, your concentration, your sustained attention, your initiative get better. You're less impulsive verbally or spending wise. You're calmer. People will say they have a longer emotional fuse. I don't get as impatient. I'm not easily frustrated. I'm not easily annoyed. The outcomes of this are very affirming. If you've never had the experience of being on medication for ADHD, you start to get it. You realize that this really isn't you. This is a disorder. And the buy-in is that the effect of the medicine is so quick that it's undeniable that there was no other mitigating factor that could have caused the reduction in symptoms beyond the medication. This is very important because people then come to understand what this is as a disorder and not who they are as a person. The day goes easier. You don't have to pedal as fast and you're getting more done in a shorter period of time, which means that you end up finding that you have extra time when you go through your day. Next slide. So month two, so in month one, in month one, some people will talk to family members. 
That is, if they have a receptive family member, they'll say, gee, I went for this evaluation. Let me tell you what's going on. I'm so eager about this. And they start sharing it with family members. This is very much dependent on who they feel close to, who has a positive relationship with them and who does not. They may share with their mother and they may not share with their father or they may share with their sister, but they don't share with their parents. Um, all of this becomes part of the discussion therapy because the nature of family relationships will change as your behavior improves and people around you can see that you're much more consistent and cooperative. Next slide. So in month two, we're going to refine the medication doses. You can click through this, this is fun. You can refine the medication doses. You can address the side effects. You may have to change the medication, either the compound or the way in which it's delivered. The long acting medications have several technologies. Sometimes a person responds favorably to drug A, but they need a beaded delivery system instead of a patch delivery system. And then you also develop a sense of comfort with the medication, with the effect of the medication, and what side effects are tolerable and what side effects are just not tolerable that necessitate a change in dose or medication. But in month two, you start breathe, breathing a sigh of relief that your consistency may now perpetuate. That is, you're doing things on a consistent basis. You can rely on yourself to execute. You can rely on yourself to do what you commit yourself to do. And as a result, your confidence goes up. Maybe this is the new normal for me. My anxiety decreases now because I actually realize I can do these things. Previously, people will avoid situations because they're uncertain as to whether they can execute and they don't want to be embarrassed by failing in front of other people. So a lot of ADHD individuals miss opportunities because they're just fearful. Next slide. And feedback from closest family members. Those family members that you spoke to start saying, you know what, you sound more comfortable, you sound happier, uh, I can talk to you without flying off the handle. Um, I realize you're getting things done. When I asked you to do the thing the other day, it actually got done in, in two days instead of three months. And so closest family members start to feel good. Often these are family members in the house that you're living in, so a spouse um, and children. So in month three, symptoms are pretty well controlled now with medication. Hopefully the medicine dose has been optimized. It's lasting over the course of the whole day and not causing problems with sleep or appetite that are intolerable. Execution is consistent and you can rely on yourself every single day. Family members now notice the consistency. In the beginning of treatment with your enthusiasm because your symptoms have been reduced, family members may say, okay, well, we support this, but, and then they wait. We've seen this before. You were good for a week. You were good for two weeks. But now at three months, people are saying, wow, this really seems like it's going to be a consistent, stable, new way of dealing with this person. As a result, you start thinking, wow, maybe there's so much more I can do in my life in the future. Next animation. And you start thinking about jobs. You can do the next animation, I think, too. So you can start thinking about jobs. Am I happy in my job? Do I want a career change? Do I want a promotion? How do I need to go working for that? And it's not that you're gonna execute on that. It's simply reflective. If you are thinking about the future in that way, it's a measure of your self-confidence having improved. Now, as your confidence improves, you start to reflect on the past. <clears throat> and people start realizing that there were a lot of opportunities in the past that were missed, either because of poor performance or because of fear. I didn't think I could do it. I didn't want to risk failing. I didn't want to be humiliated. And so you didn't take the opportunity. Now, as your confidence goes up, you start to realize, you know what? I can do that. I can take that on and I can successfully execute. It's at this point that cognitive behavioral therapy really starts to take root. The ability of, of organizational skills, time management, 
the benefits of using a planner consistently. Uh, planning out your day the night before in a on a timesheet so that you know what you're doing throughout the course of the day and realizing that you can actually stay on task. If there are difficulties in following that schedule, that's where the therapist can help shore up and decide where your uh, weakness is. Is it difficulty in sequencing a task? Is it difficulty in underestimating how much time it takes to make a task? Is it difficulty transitioning from one task to another? And everyone has their own weaknesses that the therapist can identify. Next slide. In month four, as all of this starts taking root and you think about the future in a much more positive way, you think about the past, the missed opportunities, the relationships that fell apart, the educational degrees that weren't pursued, dropping out of college. And so part of therapy has to do with getting over the grief of those losses. That is grieving that which could have been, but wasn't. And I think this is an element of psychotherapy and ADHD that really isn't discussed because in order to move forward, one really does have to grieve over the lost opportunities of the past and then realize that life doesn't have to be that way into the future. Again, cognitive behavioral therapy can help with all of this, as well as an insight-oriented psychotherapist who knows the progression of ADHD and treatment. Also, executive function becomes an issue here. There are a lot of people with ADHD whose medication helps for their attention, distractibility, and restlessness, but they're still left with a significant amount of executive function. That is the ability to organize, sequence a task, estimate time and time management, being able to hold variables in your head and your memory as you're uh, making a decision. And again, as I said earlier, the executive function deficits respond less well to medication. So one needs to be careful not to assume executive function that persists needs a higher dose of medication. At some point, you might end up on more medication than you actually need. And a skilled therapist and or psychiatrist or prescriber can make the distinction between the core symptoms of ADHD and executive function. Next slide. So now we're into month five of your treatment. Behavioral routines are much more routinized. You're more efficient as you go through the day. The careless errors have diminished both at work and at home. You're able to remember where you put the keys or your wallet or your phone or your watch, for those of you who are still wearing watches. Time management is easier. You're better able to plan out the day, stick to the schedule, shift from task to task when the designated time uh, arrives. You're writing out your schedules. As you check off your to-do list, you notice that you have more check marks on your schedule because all of those things are actually getting done. It's at this point that coworkers and supervisors notice. They realize that you're more consistent. You're participating in meetings. You're able to remember what you've been told. You can follow through with the task in a timely fashion. And you're more participating and have greater initiative in household tasks. It's very interesting when this happens because what ADHD individuals who haven't been treated fail to realize is that inconsistent execution means that people are going to walk away from you. They don't want to deal with somebody they can't rely on. As you become more consistent, you'll notice that more people want to participate with you. And so at job, coworkers may be talking to you more. They may be including you in meetings or teams. Supervisors may ask you to take on a project previously they wouldn't have invited you to do. The home relationship is better because you're helping your spouse in a um, more cooperative fashion, both in regards to your mood and, and reactivity, but also that you're participating in helping getting things done around the house. And there's better time utilization because things are getting done in half the amount of time it used to take you. So now we go into month six. I mentioned coworkers' attitudes starts changing to you. 
You may get a project you previously wouldn't have got. You might be offered a promotion you previously would have got. At six months, people start shining and they smile because they now know what they're capable of doing. It really has galvanized in their head. Periodically, patients will go off their medication or stop doing the organizational techniques and they revisit that old movie. And I can't tell you how many patients come back to me one month later or one year later saying, you know, I really tried, but having had the experience of successful treatment, I don't want to I don't want to watch this movie anymore. I want to go back to functioning the way I was. And it's interesting because once you have that experience of having your ADHD effectively treating, there's no going back. You can't say in the future, if I had only known, I would have done something different. The experience of successful treatment with your ADHD leaves you with the indelible impression of what you're capable of doing and how the ADHD causes the impairments in your life. You also start thinking about the future. Do I like my job? Do, am I in a career I like? Do I want to get a promotion and what do I need to do about that? Do I need to go back to school to get a recertification or to increase my academic or professional credentials? And I've had a number of patients who go back, they finish their undergraduate degree. I had patients go back to law school and finish their law degree or get an MBA. So, or even just to get a better job. I had one gentleman at 43 years old came to see me. We treated his ADHD. At 43, he was making $74,000 a year. And you would say, well, that's, you know, that's pretty good. Except with treatment and three years later, having quit his job, gotten a new job, got two promotions, he doubled his income. In three years, he doubled his income to $143,000 a year. It wasn't a reflection that he was a smarter person. It was a reflection that his ADHD was so impairing, he couldn't move past where he was before treatment. So I'm very, I'm very enthusiastic about treating ADHD. Now, what will disrupt this timeline? There are several things that will disrupt this timeline. First are psychiatric conditions. So we talked about severe executive dysfunction that may not respond well to medication and really needs organizational skill training. Active substance abuse. Look, if you're getting high every day or you're using narcotics or uh, alcohol regularly, that causes all kinds of cognitive deficits and no amount of ADHD medication is going to overcome that. So we do advise people to, to taper down and if, if not come off of these uh, medications. If you are actively severely clinically depressed, your cognitive ability is compromised. If you're severely demoralized, and wallowing in the morass of self-criticalness, then we need to do something about that. Severe anxiety compromises concentration and attention. So if you have a panic disorder, that needs to be treated. If you have anxiety that developed because of poor performance, then we can deal with that. I also have patients, adults with autism, high-functioning autism and ADHD. And it is important to understand that high-functioning autistic Adults can have ADHD. We shouldn't ascribe all of the behaviors to autism. And so I have patients with high functioning autism who are on ADHD medications that really raise their bar of performance, some of which have gone back to college and are successfully completing college as well. But these, are, these psychiatric conditions may disrupt the timeline that I laid out over the first six months. There are also medical conditions. So if you have repetitive head trauma that compromises your cognitive ability, or you've had severe head trauma from accidents, motor vehicle accidents, I have several patients in my practice who've had severe uh, head trauma from motor vehicle accidents, that becomes diagnostically complicated because you have to figure out which of the cognitive deficits are from the head trauma versus which of the deficits are from the ADHD. Now, having said that, the treatment of both with medications is the same. We use ADHD stimulant medications in um, traumatic brain injury as well. And then there are other medical illnesses I won't go into in detail, but as a physician, I need to be aware of other medical considerations as well as medications that they may be on in regards to drug-drug interactions. So let's say that you have several conditions that you are binge drinking on the weekends, that you have bipolar disorder, that you have a severe generalized anxiety disorder, and you have ADHD. 
well, gosh, that's complicated. How do we decide which diagnosis to treat first? And the object here is to treat one without worsening the others. Next animation. The order to do this is, animation please, thank you. So the order here is you gotta get the alcohol and substance abuse under control. Then you get, you stabilize the mood disorder. Then you treat the severe anxiety disorders and then you treat ADHD. And why is that? Because all of the previous non-ADHD diagnoses cause cognitive deficits. And if you don't treat those, you don't know which cognitive deficits go to ADHD and which cognitive deficits go to the other disorder. The other reason we do it in this priority is that any of the medications we use for ADHD can make the other psychiatric diagnoses worse if they're not under control. So this is the order of the logic. I wrote about this almost 20 years ago, and this has now been verified by subsequent research as well. Next slide. So let's summarize this conceptually. In the first two months, the focus is very much on getting the symptoms under control. In months two to four, your function improves. You realize that you're able to do things better and rely on yourself. In months four to six, you really start noticing the outcomes. Your work review is better. Your relationships are better. Your confidence is better. You're less impulsive. And when you get to six to 12 months, your quality of life is clearly improving. Not only is the quality of life in the present better, but you're imagining that the quality of your life in the future can be better because the world opens up in regards to the opportunities you now feel you can undertake. The next slide. So what are the conclusions here? As I've laid out, I believe that there is a predictable time course of improvement over the first six months. Next. Understanding this timeline allows for the introduction of specific treatments when are best utilized. So when do you introduce medication? When do you introduce the cognitive behavioral therapy? When do you introduce some insight-oriented therapy or family or couples therapy? The timeline allows you to participate in the next steps to be undertaken. And the last point is accepting this timeline facilitates a patient's in the process. That is, if you know what we're doing at each time point here, there is confidence and hope that you'll eventually get to where you want to be. And I think that that is the last slide. Thank you for your attention. Hope this has been helpful. It's very concrete information. <laughs>